And we're live. Welcome back to another Corona Geek here where we talk all about mobile app development using Corona SDK. I'm your host, Charles McKeever, and today we have a special show. We've got a show that we really didn't plan out, so, so to speak, but uh, it's something that is uh, happening kind of on the fly here. We've got uh, with us Walter Liu. Hey, Walter. Hey, guys. And, hey, guys. And, and today uh, is the announcement of Corona Free. Corona now is officially free. So if you're a basic or a pro subscriber, uh, then or if you're new to the platform, it's free, and, which is fantastic. So we're going to talk about that. Walter's going to give us the skinny on that. And uh, we're also going to talk about or show some desktop app support, which is also very cool as well. So, so thanks for joining us today. Uh, we will also get to, near the end of our, our uh, session here. We will also get to our game development series. So we've been doing a game uh, development series over the past couple of weeks where we actually have been breaking down an endless runner game and uh, we're going to continue that by showing how to put up some walls. We're going to actually start some coding. We've been talking up to this point about planning and how the project is structured but we're actually going to get into the code bits. So stay tuned for that as well. So Walter, let's, let's talk about this whole corona free thing. You're going to have to come off mute to do that. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Somebody, uh, if everybody would, to uh, mute your I was going to let you uh, yeah. caption this later when you uh, fix this in post. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess, well, we just announced this morning um, in conjunction with GDC that the Corona SDK is now completely free. And uh, what that means is that essentially everything that you were able to get in the pro subscription tier is now available to everybody. Um, and so, you know, previously, if you wanted to get Access Daily Build or in-app purchase or premium graphics features or, you know, pro-tier plugins, you had to pay money. That's now completely free. So yeah, that's the really big news is that we just want to make Corona available to as many developers as possible and take the friction out of just adopting Corona. We just want to remove any reasons why you would not want to use Corona. Um, and so... Uh, in addition, I think, you know, we still have other paid products like Corona Enterprise and Corona Cards for iOS and Android, uh, but Corona SDK itself will be completely free. So I'm so just to be clear there, you're saying that Enterprise and Corona Cards, those are still paid products? Is that what you're saying? That's right. Okay. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and I, I would imagine that the... Is, is the community kind of split as to who, who uses that? I mean, if you're Enterprise, are you clearly Enterprise? And, and if you're Pro, you're clearly Pro? How does that break down, do you know? Um, I don't have the all the numbers in front of me, but I, I know I know a lot of people, um, you know, were pro, um, and a lot of, but I think there were even more that were starter users that just, you know, used the basic stuff in Corona and um, weren't using all the features. And a lot of that had to do with just cost. They wanted to play with a lot of the features that Corona came with for free already, um, like just the very basic things, like putting images on the screen, but they didn't, and they wanted to get their feet wet, get some apps in the store, but they hadn't been able to take full advantage of all sort of advanced graphics features, um, a lot of the more advanced plugins, or even just being able to have access to daily builds and really, you know, use the latest greatest features of Corona. Uh, I think in addition, they actually will also now get access to Windows Phone 8 for Corona cards for free as part of that. So pretty exciting stuff. Oh, cool. Oh yeah. So yeah, I guess my, my question is more really geared towards the fact that you know if you're in the enterprise space, you uh, you know you're probably you can do a, a ton of stuff with uh, Pro, and then if you're in the enterprise space, then you're actually integrating with third-party libraries, or you know you're kind of going beyond right. um, the Pro user. So right. So if you're an enterprise user, I think the, the kind of user you're typically going to be the ones who are very comfortable with Objective C um, on iOS and comfortable with Java on, on Android. And so those kinds of developers will say, you know what, I want to customize Corona, um, do more than what you know we have out of the box, which is a lot. But sometimes they've got their sort of niche thing they need to integrate their their niche SDK or service or product that they need to integrate. Um, and so enterprise sort of really fits a nice sort of gap for those folks. So let me ask you, so I want to ask this question because I know it's one that's going to pop into people's mind right away, is, is what about the people who just purchased or renewed their license? Uh, what about those guys? What do they get? Yeah, so, you know, we realized that, you know, some people had bought subscriptions recently and we wanted to take care of them. So what we did is we said, look, we, we took a look at sort of the, the basic pro and enterprise tiers and we said, hey, we're going to give you some amazing and free upgrades. So for the current basic customers, uh, we're going to upgrade them to Corona Enterprise um, so and give them a month-for-month -month subscription to Enterprise. 
Um, and, so, and in addition, we'll also give them uh, the same amount of time with Corona Cards, iOS, and Android. Um, with current SDK Pro customers, we're going to upgrade them to current enterprise as well, but instead we're going to give them one and a half months for every month they have, um, and the same for Corona Cards uh, for iOS and Android. And then for enterprise customers, you know, obviously they're still going to continue to be paid customers, but we didn't want them to feel left out. So we said, you know what, we're going to give you um, Corona Cards, iOS, and Corona Cards Android licenses uh, one month, uh, month for month. Um, and so that way, you know, if they want to be able to explore, and, and, and for those enterprise customers, we thought, hey, they're already using native code. Um, let's, why don't we give them, you know, an additional access to Corona Cards as well, because I think they'll really be able to take full advantage of that. What about those folks who just say, you know, look, enterprise is definitely not for me, and I just bought a, a license, and, you know, what else you got? Yeah, so what we decided was, we said, hey, look, there are people that bought really recently, and they bought in the 2015 calendar year, so January 1st, 2015, or after. We said, you know, there's a chance that some of them, look, well, won't want these upgrades. And so we said, you can request a prorated refund, um, and all you have to do is ref uh, email us at refund at coronalabs.com, by March 15th, um, the, the end of day, the end of the day in March 15th in the Pacific time. And if you meet uh, the, those conditions, uh, we'll issue a refund that's prorated. Okay, that seems. I mean, that seems uh, seems fair. I mean, you know, I know there. I've seen a few people who said, "Hey, you know, I just renewed my uh, subscription to Corona." You know, and so right, that would yeah. definitely that would definitely be a concern. So yeah. good. Uh, okay, so. One of the questions that came up today on Facebook was, uh, you know, wh why are, why is why make Corona free? What's what's the uh, the deal there? Well, we just wanted to take the friction out. I, I just got an email from a longtime developer who was one of our first developers. He even wrote some things for our ecosystem. He's like, you know what? I just uh, it's great that you did this because I was thinking about uh, playing with Corona, but I just you know just couldn't justify the cost. And we hear that story a lot, so we wanted to encourage more and more folks to use it. Um, and so that's one of the big reasons that we decided, hey, let's let's do this. We want to make more and more people just, you know, just take reasons away from people not to use Corona. Uh, more, the more people are using Corona, the, the better off we are. I think maybe what the person's asking is, well, how does that work? What's the catch? You know, not everything's not free. Um, and, and sorry, I'm getting distracted by uh, um, one of the guys. Uh, so <laughs> there was this camera moving around uh, on one of the panelists. Um, so... Uh, so, you know, what's the catch? What, what's going on there? And, you know, I think, you know, Fuse Powered, what, they make their money by helping developers make money. So, and, and as I said in my blog post, you know, when, when you guys succeed, we, we succeed. And so we, we just want to sort of align our business models with that. So we are going to make, you know, some of the Fuse monetization technologies available to you guys. It's not going to be required in the sense that you'll have to put ads in. But if you want to do ads and you want to do in-app purchase, um, and you're paying attention to how people are using it um, uh, from the most ex uh, how the most successful developers are using it, um, they're going to be wanting to use technologies like Fuse's monetization engine. And so we said, hey, look, we're going to make that integration available to you guys. You don't have to do ads if you don't want to, um, but if you do and you make lots of money, then we're going to make some money. And so that's sort of how we approach it. We're not, it's not any sort of like, we're not trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes here. It's just, it's just like if you guys succeed, we succeed, and for us, it's all about just creating more excitement around the Corona community. More people using Corona, more people making money using Corona. Um, the more successful we're going to be as well. So that's that's pretty much the story. Well, if you do math the way I do math, uh, you take the uh, yearly subscription price to Corona and you subtract, you know, you, you uh, subtract it out, and now it's free. Um, and you make an app and you make a dollar. Well, you've now officially made a dollar, right? You've made. One dollar profit. So you know what I'm saying? Like you don't. There's no. There's no cost to, to build. No cost to publish. You you. Everything is pure right, profit exactly. after that. Right. And, and it, we we recognize. And we saw that. You know, for the past. You know, I've been doing this. Corona started six years ago. So <laughs> we seen the, We seen this sort of argument from day one. Was just like, well, I, I just don't want to pay that much money up front. Um, and so we're like, okay, well, let's just take the friction out. Um, and you know, the thing about. The thing about free is Corona SDK, the, the Corona SDK itself is truly free. If you look at another announcement today that happened, I think someone put it on the, on the comments of the blog, another engine also went free, quote unquote, but there were strings attached. They were going to say, oh, well, you also have to give us 5% revenue share of all the revenue that you make. We're not doing that. We're saying, look, you, the only time we make money is if you happen to use our monetization engine with Fuse that helps you make more money. So if we help you make more money, then we should we should get some money out of that. And but that that's all happens transparently to you you guys. We don't actually have to 
you guys don't actually have to worry about it. You guys are going to get your cut, and we've already worked out our cut with the other folks in the back end. So there's there's no magic here. It's just it's all like everyone is happy. Um, it, so. it, it seems to make a lot of sense that you know that there's uh you know there there are advertisers and then there are consumers and then Fuse and and Corona are in the middle of that, and so the developer can create apps and be a part of that ecosystem and not have right. to be charged. And but the advertisers the one effectively paying. You know they're they're, they're actually the, the, the advertiser is the one who is funding the project. Right, and so so what we're working on is essentially um, a Fuse plugin um, to do this. I think someone asked this question just now um, in, in the, on the panel of saying, hey, well, how's this going to work? So there will be a Fuse plugin, um, and we're still working out all the details. I think there will be some something that we're integrating to the core that's always going to be there, but it won't be, it won't be like something that you have to use. Um, and so it'll just be there and available to you. And if you want to use it, great. And if you don't want to use it, then that's up to you. Um, I think more broadly, what we're, we're what what the big announcements that have been coming from Fuse um, this week and last week, and and with the session that I mentioned that um, that that's happening this week at GDC, what we're talking about is thinking about monetization more holistically. So I think usually people think of of monetization as let's just do in-app purchase, let's just do advertising, um, and think about them in isolation. And what Fuse has done is said, no, let's think about that holistically. Because even if you're doing in-app purchases, you want to make offers within your app that basically promote the kinds of merchandise or goods that you're selling in your in-app purchase um, store. So, for example, maybe you've got, maybe it's Thanksgiving, right? And you want to do some sort of promotion around saying, hey, buy today, and all all the things in, that are in-app purchase are 25% off, right? That's sort of that's and sort of is a form of an offer or advertisement. And so what Fuse is saying is, look, let's look, let's look at those holistically, so that you can sort of give a spectrum of the types of ads you want to do. And sometimes maybe you only want to do these kinds of offers. They're not true ads in the in the advertising sense, but they're sort of they're sort of like making offers or merchandising type ads that are sort of selling your inner purchase products. Um, but maybe later on you want to do an A/B test. We say, hey, maybe let me put an ad, one or two ads for half of my customers, and you maybe you may find that you're going to make more money. Um, you're going to make some more money off these guys when you do it, you know, 5% of these guys get ads. Um, and the magic is that it all happens server-side because you don't have to resubmit your app to suddenly change the logic. You can just say on a few server, hey, I suddenly want to serve up some ads to these guys and see what happens. Do an experiment. And, in fact, there is a, a, a large studio that recently did it in a, uh, using the private beta version of this, this Fuse product, and they were seeing a lift. They said, you know, they, they always focus on in a purchase before, they suddenly decided, hey, let's just do a few ads, and suddenly they're saying, hey, wow, I'm seeing uh, a lift in the number of people buying in-app purchase products, um, and it, it was it was it was pretty powerful. So we we are uh, I, I hate talking about this because it's not available to you guys right now, but I wanted to give you a sense of where things are headed, um, and, and this is something that's going to be actively discussed at GDC and, and demonstrated at the booth at GDC at the Fuse uh, Kernel Labs booth that we have. Um, so, uh, for those of you who are out there um, who are going to be at GDC, please come. Um, uh, but otherwise, you'll be definitely hearing about the, more of this soon. So, yeah, um, just a quick preview of that. So, just to add on to what Walter's talking about there, if you're at GDC, uh, uh, John Walsh is actually pre pre presenting a session tomorrow at 11:15 a.m. Uh, on uh, player-centric uh, monetization. So, if you guys you know are in the area, go check that out. Uh, I think it's going to be recorded by some of the some of the staff, but uh, but if you want to see it live, you know you definitely go uh, check that out. And and then I guess another part of that too, uh, Walter, correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, um, you know Fuse Powered has released a new um, a, a new portal or new um, dashboard where developers can you know yeah, there'll be a new dashboard. Data. I think it'll be more relevant to folks that are using it currently. Um, mm -hmm. And there are there are a few select Chrome developers um, who are in the private beta who will be who will probably be interested in, in seeing that. But as far as the general community, when we launch this, you'll just see the new dashboard, which is a lot better than the old dashboard. I think it'll be a lot more in line with how you want to be approaching, you know, thinking about monetization with your end users. Um, helping and it'll help you analyze them. It'll help you segment them and say, hey, uh, things like things along the lines of, hey, have they done an in-app purchase in the past month? Okay, maybe I won't want to show them any ads for for another month because they bought in the last month. Or have they completed level two? Okay, maybe now I will start, you know, offering them some of these in-app purchase items that I, that are interesting. Um, but but that level of segmentation, I think, is really powerful because it's really contextual um, and it really makes sense to the developer. It's not just sort of blindly saying, let me just stick 
an ad or an offer here or there. And, and, and I think a lot of people naively do that, and I think that's why it's been, it's been pretty ineffective. Um, and I think that's, that's sort of what Fuse's is strength is, is helping you understand, hey, you want to you sort of judiciously place these sort of ads in certain places, and sometimes you want to have certain rules that say, even if I you know, execute this code, there won't actually be an ad shown because there's actually no point that, that the rule wasn't satisfied on the server side, so there's no reason to show an ad, even though in code I may have said show an ad. Yeah, I got, I got to sit in on a demo uh, on Friday of the new dashboard and, and, and how things are broken down. And the one thing that kind of stuck out to me was this aspect of segmentation, you know, being able to, to, to break up uh, and see what was happening by groups, you know. So if you've got uh, one of the things, the examples that was used is like, you know, if you want to be able to display certain types of ads to um, uh, U.S., to, to users who were in the U.S. but had French devices, you know, or or who, who were actually in France and had uh, French devices. You know, you could you could break it down uh, granularly and then be able to show, like just like you say, based on certain rules and stuff like that. So uh, making making advertising smarter sounds like a great idea. I mean, it's something that I know people have been looking for for a long time. Right, and it's not just ads. It's also just offers to your existing in-app purchase um, products. So it doesn't even have to be like ads for Coca-Cola. Um, or promoting the next Angry Birds game, right? It can be just ads within your, within your app. So that's that's the cool thing is you have sort of that full flexibility. Excellent. Well, hey, so you talked about GDC. You mentioned some of the apps that are being de demoed there. Uh, I've got a few of them here. Do you want to talk about those briefly? Yeah. So the other thing that we uh, announced today was that we are going to be supporting new platforms, um, and this goes back to sort of the state of Corona uh, post roadmap that I gave. Uh, basically maybe a month and a half ago, um, or, or about a month ago, actually. Um, and so what we're going to be, we're announcing today is that our intention to support Mac apps and, and Windows uh, 32 apps. Um, so the same apps that you're writing for iOS and Android and Windows Phone 8 will now be things that you can ship on the Mac App Store and uh, as Win32 apps. Uh, so you potentially could target the Steam App Store, for example, or just release it as a download. Um, yourself. And so what Charles is showing in the screen share right now um, are demos of four apps that we've uh, gotten permission to, to show. And um, so one of these is Alone, which is a really fantastic app um, that uh, is really difficult also. And I'm not good at it, so I'm letting Charles play it because I'll just embarrass myself if I try to play this. Um, and looks like he's a pro. No, he's an expert. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out the, the simplest here. <laughs> 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 Come on, dazzle us with your skills. Yeah, now so we're gonna obviously we're gonna get a little bit of uh, frame rate. Frame and th this frame, frame rate is due to Hangouts, not because of Corona. I just want to clarify that. Yeah, we always get whacked <laughs> by the uh, the Hangouts frame rate. Uh, there is a I thought that, what wasn't there. Hold on, in the settings, it seems like oh yeah, here we go. Here's the here's what I play on. I like to play on God mode. <laughs> then then what are the sound effects? Uh, well, the sound effects don't come out on, on Google Hangout, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's an audio shortcoming of Google Hangout. But, uh, but yeah, so you basically... I can make sound effects like last time. Oh, yeah. So basically it's an, an avoidance. You're trying to avoid... If you were going to play this correctly, you'd try to avoid all those jagged edges, which I can't do. So. Oh, that's why you're able to fly through them. I was wondering about that. Yeah, I'm in God mode, so... Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm having... So, uh, yeah, let, let's show some of the other apps. Okay, and then uh, here's Freeze, which is uh, we've been featured, you know, lots in the uh, iTunes Store. So hold on here. So, so this is a puzzle, kind of a puzzle game. We flip through some of the intro stuff here. So I'm just using the mouse right now to essentially move. And it's, it's running smoothly on your computer, right? This is just a Hangout. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. For Hangouts are terrible for for really for demoing this kind of stuff. But yeah, it runs just as smooth on the on the desktop as it runs on the device. So, how to make your app look bad? Show it on Hangouts. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you have over there was the overlay uh, notifications, you know, little buttons and stuff, and uh, and things like that. And then and you can freeze the game for a period of time so that you can move the move the, the puzzle around. Uh, anyway, so here, you, the, the important parts here are that you can see that the game is still sort of in uh, mobile mode, 
All right, so it's still kind of a... Yeah, well, it's in a portrait orientation. Yeah, but here's um, Lost City. Lost City one, right, is, is going to be landscape, which fits better, and it's it's a great Myst-style game, if you guys are familiar with the Myst-style games back in the 90s. Yeah, and, and of course, this one almost takes up my entire screen, <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm sure that's uh, how it was packaged. Uh, right, so we're, we're still figuring out how we want to do full screen versus just windowed modes, and we're thinking that probably... Uh, I was just having a discussion with one of the engineers who's working on it that probably it's just going to be some config.lua Lua settings that control at startup whether it's a full screen or not and whether it can enter into windowed or whether it can go from window to full screen, things like that. So so there's that, that style of game. Um, and then RGB Express, of course, is also running in sort of a uh, portrait mode. And, and all these games are are fun. I mean, if you haven't tried these out, definitely go check them out. We'll put a link in the show notes to all of them so you can check them out in the app stores. But, uh, you know, so RGB Express, you're basically trying to deliver packages. Um, so you just want to drag your route, and you're supposed to just try to pass, uh, pick up packages, and then deliver them to their destination. So Yeah, it's and too bad you can't hear the sound, because I think the sound really adds a, a significant element to a lot of these games, just in terms of the production quality. Yeah, and what, probably what I'll, what I'll do is uh, I can create some separate videos just kind of walking through these and show them running. That way people can get the... They can get the I can capture the sound from this side. But that's, uh, but that's kind of a look at it, and uh, lots of good stuff there. And you guys are... So it's all being uh, demoed at GDC, correct? Yeah, it's being demoed at GDC. Our, our next major milestone is to essentially package it up so that we can share it out with you guys in some sort of private beta form. So, and any any kind of I know you hate timelines, but any kind of a timeline on that? Uh, I'm not going to give any timelines on that one. <laughs> uh, only because I don't want to put pressure on my engineers because I think they'll just do things more quickly if they don't feel pressure. They're they're doing it as quickly as possible, but um, I think the fact that we're demoing GDC is a big sign of how far along we are. It's in it's interesting that you mentioned that because there is a sort of diminishing resu uh, results, right? There is a certain amount of uh, concept around. Uh, more time doesn't necessarily equal better product, right? So you kind of want to get things done quickly, but at the same time, pressure doesn't necessarily make people perform better. So Yeah, it doesn't always. I think there's certain situations where it's called for. I think they were already under a lot of pressure to get these demos ready for GDC, so I don't want to add more heat right now. I want to give them a little bit, a few days to sort of just relax and not have to worry about things and just yeah. plug along. And they're, they're pretty excited. They're pushing things forward. Um, which will mean probably a little bit of instability in some daily builds just because of a lot of under-the-hood changes, but um, but we are pushing forward. All right, well, we've got a full panel here. kind of want to open it up for everybody to ask their questions, uh, before, and then that way we can let Walter go off and and make more Corona stuff. So, <laughs> um, so Ed, I know you have questions. Do you, do you want to start off? Um, I actually answered most of my questions. If somebody wants to jump in first, uh, I... Yeah, you did a great job as far as going down the list even before I asked you any questions. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, those were just, I just brain dumped those questions and thought, uh, what, what are people going to want to ask? Uh, Brian, you got anything? Greg? No, I, I think everybody's just very excited about all these changes. Um, I know that the Mac and PC is something that you guys have been working on for a long time and, and now and the community has wanted and can't wait to start publishing to the the Mac and uh, Windows stores for for our apps. Uh, mm -hmm. HTML5 was kind of a preview of that, but now we've now we've got native apps so, or n native platform. Beyond hey, us. Hey Walter, is there is there going to be an expansion of HTML5 support? So HTML5 uh, is still on our radar. Obviously, um, our resources are focused on Mac app and and Win32. So uh, doing that and HTML5 is probably too much for us to choose. So we sort of put that. Uh, on a sort of lower priority track, so we're focused mostly on getting you Mac and Windows first, um, and then I think we'll be able to come back to HTML5. And I, and I know we talked about this before the show, before I hit the start button, but then you, I don't remember if you mentioned it since then. Steam? Steam support? Yeah, so, um, you know, I don't necessarily know that we'll have it built into the, the Windows the store, but, you know, I think what we'll do is we'll, you know, figure out if we can if there's an enterprising developer who wants to help us get sort of a Steam support plugin going, and obviously if someone is interested in doing that, we might be able to get arrange it so that you can get earlier access to uh, 
Windows support for um, Corona. So <laughs> you get this look on your face, and you're like, "And I want you to do something." And I was like looking at exactly at you, and I'm going to leave with you, uh, <laughs> you. <laughs> yes, I'm you. Writing a note. Yes, I'm, I'm taking a note. That. I am talking to you. <laughs> you know, it, 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 seem, it would seem like a natural progression of things, desktop apps, that sort of thing. It seems like Steam is a, a very popular. Right, right, absolutely. And so, so I think, I think just to taking a step back, one of the one of our internal debates was whether or not we should do universal Windows apps or Win32 based apps. And we chose Win and, and universal Windows apps allow you to run on the Surface and run on you know across the phone and and tablets and all these other devices. And we chose Win32 apps specifically because we knew Win32 apps were the things that were compat compatible with Steam. Um, and, and so that was the reason why I keep emphasizing Win32 as opposed to just Windows apps. Um, because the Win app store that Microsoft has, uh, is, you, you, can, you, can, you can target it, and that's what Microsoft is pushing for, but we realize that from the many conversations we've had um, in terms of our research, everyone who's an indie seems to care a lot more about Steam, and so that's why we chose Win32-based apps. Well, with uh, what you know, thirty years of install years. base. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know Four why. Four million people online at any one time. Yeah. Right. Uh, exactly. Exactly. So, um, I have a quick question: um, Will building for Windows uh, be akin to building for iOS or Android, or will it be more like the Windows Phone, where it's going to be Corona cards based? And are we packaged so, inside of a Visual Basic? Well, so, so there's no question that the support we have for desktop won't. Um, our, our, our initial, what we put out there initially will be just a subset of what you have for Corona SDK. I think our goal is to sort of say, let's, let's fall on the path of Corona cards from the perspective of limiting the feature set. Um, and we do think that in certain cases, it will make sense for lots of developers to be able to have to, to use Xcode or Visual Studio so they can add um, additional functionality that we just don't provide. Uh, whether or not there will be a sort of a easy one-click button path from the simulator to just do a quick build of an app that may or may not that will that will just have plain vanilla functionality. Um, that's something that's that we could consider. Um, but um, but I do think that a lot of people will want to have sort of you know custom this or that that they need to add inevitably just because it's a desktop application. Um, so part of that may be a little bit unavoidable. Things like menuing and things like that are not things that we would be able to wrap up cleanly in a Lua API. Um, yeah. If you want to add new menu items, things like that, you're inevitably going to have to deal with the native, you know, files, uh, native resource files for that uh, for that platform, just to deal with that kind of stuff. And sure. So, so in, in that from that perspective, we are going to package it. Though we want to make it as easy as possible. So, for example, we're working on things like saying, hey, if you if we have to use Xcode, let's at least create a a new project. Uh, let's let's extend. Um, the new project template. So if you go to Xcode and say new project, you'll see a Corona, a Corona Mac app project that you can create, and it'll create a project for you. It'll create a Corona folder that you can add your Lua files into, and so you can still target Corona Simulator to run those files, so you can preview really, really quickly in that in a Corona style workflow. But then you still have the Xcode project for all these weird sort of like entitlements and all these weird things that you need to do that Apple really requires on 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 iOS or on the Xcode. Mac side of things. Will uh, will targeting desktop OSs be an SDK level feature, or will that most likely get bundled into like an enterprise or Corona cards type of thing, or maybe its own feature? Um, we, I am. That's sort of a little bit of debate. I think there's there, there's I'm on my side, and then there are um, people on the business side because <laughs> we're a parent company now. There's uh, pesky so people. I, I'm no longer money. the master of the fate. <laughs> Of things, just to make that clear, <laughs> I, 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 my opinion counts, but it's not the ultimate thing that counts. Uh, I'll just tell you what my personal preference is that we should we should just make it available for free um, because I think the more people that use it, it's a great it's a great way for other people to be introduced to the Corona platform because they focus exclusively on desktop apps and gets them into mobile. It's a great way for you guys who are doing mobile apps to. Um, go on to desktop side of things, but my personal preference is to make it free, but I can't make a promise if that's what you're looking for. I heard free. That's all you, I heard. You heard it here, people on the forums. Walter said it would be free. We'll cut that part out of the video. <laughs> I'm going to repeat this for the next minute, just so it can't be edited out. That, uh, no, 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 I'm going no. to interject Too late. <laughs> that uh, I did not promise anything about free. We're going to make a vine out of it. Headroom video, way, you um, free. 
I won't just, be surprised if I'm unable to build on my account later today. By the way, did I just mention <laughs> that I did not promise that this would be free? <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing you can do that we can't cut. <laughs> By the way, um, I also promised it wasn't going to be free. <laughs> I am just going to keep playing this Poor game. Walter, now he feels under I can gun. play this game all day, guys. Uh, <laughs> I got a question for you, Walter. Yeah. Uh, Anybody else? I'm going to put it in the chat window. Does, does the chat window get shown? No. Bastards. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it does, but you gotta, you got to click it. you got to choose. Oh, Google right, so I'm going to choose to everything. tell you that uh, this... Well, there's no guarantee that desktop... <laughs> 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 desktop. But we all hope it will be. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And features. Uh, one question that might be you may not be able to answer, but currently... Very few people do this, but I use the simulator sort of like a poor man's desktop while I'm working. Yeah. Uh, and on the uh, if you run the Android simulator, yeah. When you're running on OS 10 in any simulator, you can get the keyboard. So I use keyboard inputs for a lot of my shortcuts while I'm editing my levels and stuff like that. I make my own little mini editors. We kind of had this discussion a long time ago. Okay. My question is: Is will the uh, key inputs work for the? Windows and OS 10. I think so. I think. I mean. I think they would have to. Yeah, I'm hoping yeah. so. That and probably like uh, joystick support. Yeah, that, that, that would, it'd, be, it'd be odd if they didn't work. Cause... Yeah. Okay. Um, well. Though, uh, though that that statement may contain uh, forward-looking statements that may or may not reflect actual reality. <laughs> You've gotten you into the disclaimer mode. <laughs> disclaimer mode off. This hangout may or may not contain forward-looking statements that may or may not reflect actual or intended reality. Carl, uh, you not talk to the legal team about this? You're supposed I to am, the beginning. I'm totally the slapping that on the beginning. Our, our lawyers tell <laughs> okay, us we're going to take this offline, Charles, but we're going to have a talk. You need to have this little thing at the beginning. And end. I'm having a t-shirt made out of that. <laughs> Watch out. We're going to have a new phrase. Hey, we'll, do, we'll get a freeze frame of Walter's face. I feel like I've cu if, if you if you start cutting this out, your hangout's going to be like two minutes long because I'm going to keep interjecting these things. Uh, that's good. <laughs> Anybody else got any other questions? I, that the can, I know can how, you guys, how how folks are in the forums. Walter said this. <laughs> you said this. I'm like, jeez. <laughs> I don't think there's any I feel like I need a rest. telephone. <laughs> that's that's just love, Walter. That's just all that is. That's just love. <laughs> All right. Well, well, good. Thanks for, uh, for for shedding some light on that, or not, and uh, <laughs> yeah, or not. I don't know. <laughs> and so, if 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 you are thinking about building an app and you haven't tried Corona yet, go try it out. Now it's free, uh, and and there are other features coming uh, down the road. And uh, also, there if you there are other features. So, um, does any if anyone knows how to write shader code, who's already familiar with GLSL? Send me a note, but you have to know GLSL already. I, I don't have time to teach you. So, <laughs> but if you already happen to know it, send me a, a note at Walter at CoronaLabs.com. Well, and that's and that's worth mentioning as well. Corona Labs is, is still hiring. Is that correct? Uh, well, we just hired a couple of folks, so um, I don't know if we filled everything already, but we might still be hiring. Okay. So uh, we are in particular looking for folks that are local um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, we want to work out of our Palo Alto office, but yeah. Okay, excellent. So yeah, if that's you, uh, we'll have a link in the show notes to where you can. Yeah, so just send me another email also. So. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Uh, yeah. And and if you haven't been to Fuse Powered in a while, definitely re recommend that you do that. Like we said, they just revamped their website. They just yep. launched a new dashboard. Um, so there's lots of information over there, so you can get started. And I have to, I'm proud to say that they based it off our CSS. So. Oh, sweet. Yeah. yeah. Though I, though I think I think we did a better job on our site. Don't tell them. <laughs> <laughs> I won't send them a link to this video. Okay, got it. check. All right, Walter. Well, thanks for joining us. We're gonna, you know, you can just hang out with us and okay. listen to this next segment if you want, or if you gotta go, that's cool too. Uh, I think actually probably need to take off, but if there's any more questions, um, I can uh, try to answer them with the caveat that they may or may not contain forward-looking statements. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Walter. All right. Thanks, thanks guys. Okay. Bye. All right, Ed. Uh, I think we got half an hour or so. Do you you want to you want to jump into our, our? We'll do it in okay. short order. How's that sound?
Okay, so I'm gonna while you're doing that, while you're pulling that up, I'm gonna remind everybody that we are actually uh, engaged in a game development series where we're taking an endless runner, we're taking Zigzag Boom, and we're breaking it down into its parts, and then we're going to rebuild it, almost like uh, the Six Million Dollar Man. We've got the we have the technology, and we're we're going to uh, show you all the steps. Last couple of uh, hangouts we were actually talking about the, the requirements and kind of the planning and how the project was uh, organized so if you haven't seen those go back and watch those hangouts I think that started out with uh, hangout 128 129 something like that so go over to youtube.com slash corona geek and check out those videos uh, and then today's conversation is really going to be about uh, laying down some code and putting in the walls and starting the, the coding process is that I'm sorry. Yes, my, my my audio is on. Exactly. So last week I promised that we would get to walls, and I I gave a hint that making walls is actually the most complicated seeming part of the entire development. You would think it isn't, but I think the big problem that people are going to run into is that when they go to create walls, first of all, what are we talking about when we say walls? What I've got here on the screen is a couple of screenshots or a few screenshots, and to remind people the way this game works is, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit, the left image here is the starting screen and this little dot here is our character and we have a hallway in a sense that moves up and to the left and when we start the game the character is going to start moving up and to the left. Then if we tap the screen the character will change directions from minus 45 degrees where zero is up and down to uh, positive 45 degrees. So we tap the screen and it basically goes left or right depending on where it was currently going. And our whole goal is to stay inside of the hallway. So the tricky part here is, is you would think that drawing lines at 45, basically what is lines at 45 degree angles would be straightforward. But there are challenges. The first challenge is, is to you can draw a single line, but if you want to draw two parallel lines that form a nice hallway like this with good good corners and a little glow effect and a nice colored background, it's not as straightforward as it seems, especially when you want to introduce uh, physics and collision detection. Uh, another thing that makes this difficult is uh, after you get all that working, you need to set up your initial screen so that it looks like this. What you want is the first hallway to be very long. You want it to be centered on the screen so that when you put your player in, in the center, which is where he starts or it starts, it's in the middle of the hallway. So I experimented with a bunch of different techniques. And what I settled on was um, sort of a... Some of the techniques I tried were drawing lines. Now, you're not supposed to. You're, people always tell you in the forums, don't use lines for anything that you want to have um, collision detection on because while you can create lines and add physics bodies to them, the results will always be somewhat arbitrary seeming. They're not arbitrary, but you really have to understand the rules of how physics bodies work when attached to a line. And there, there are rules. So I did that first thought maybe, maybe I could <clears throat> experiment and show pe people how to do that, but that did not work out. Then I tried uh, New Polygon. So there is a more recent um, display object called the Polygon, which is you can create a multi, uh, what is the, multi-vertex object. So typically objects in Corona have four vertices. They're rectangles, four sides, four vertices for the corners. A polygon can have four, five, six, seven, eight vertices to create an arbitrary shape. So I experimented with, just for fun, using an arbitrary shape to create the hallways. That also did not work well. It didn't work well because we ran into, I ran into the same problem, which is once you put the physics body on, then you really have to understand the winding, um, the shape, the orientation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So long story short. <coughs> I settled on the good old uh, new rectangle or new image rect, depending on which way we want to approach it. They both come out to be the same. They produce a rectangle which can be rotated, positioned. You can apply a body to it which will have the same size as the visual parameters, so there's no extra work. And let me just start walking you through this. So before you before you do that, I, I just want to 
I, I work best if I know kind of like visually, and then and then I get into the code. So you're showing us the screenshot of the Zigzag Boom, which is the app that we're using as a model. Uh, are you saying that this will be composed of rectangles? Yes. So if I, at the end of the day, what we're going to have is a hallway that has. It's probably a little bit hard to see my cursor here, so let me zoom way in. Um, it's going to have a wall like this mm -hmm. on either side, which is the part that your body will collide with, your character will collide with if you don't turn. We will create a little fake glow effect and a background so that it distinguishes itself, looks a little bit different from the, the entire screen, which is a darker blue. And I'm okay. going to walk you through this step by, step by step so you understand sort of the logic of how I, I approach this. All right? Okay. Okay. Thank so, you. So uh, before I do that, I just wanted to point out that last week I showed folks the different modules. Um, and one of those modules was layers.lua. So it's really important for people to understand that when you want to create ordered layering in your game where you always guarantee that one object will be on top of some other category of objects. For example, let's say I want to display a background of one color, then I want to have my hallway, and then I want to display my player. But I always want my player and all the particle effects to be rendered over the top of the hallway and the background. Now one way to do that is to put them all in one display group and then do magical heavy lifting to ensure that they're always sorted correctly. That's the wrong way to do it. The right way to do it is to create a bunch of display groups and then organize them in such a way that one display group is on top of another one and then when you create your background you put it in the group for backgrounds. When you create your hallway you put it in the group for the hallway and when you create your player, you put it in the player group. And then the sorting vertically, top to bottom, bottom to top, as far as how you look at the world, is always handled for you. There's no thought involved. So I have created, and we're going to come back to this again and again, because um, when we start talking about cameras, probably next week or the week after, we're going to talk about how we can use display groups to create a camera effect. And I won't go into too much what a camera effect is, but the camera effect that we are going to achieve sometime in the future is the player, when it moves, will always seem as if it's staying in the center of the screen, and the world will move around it. So the way you do that, in a nutshell, is put the player in one group, put the other contents in another group, and move the groups around and then reposition the player every frame so that the player gets rendered in the center of the screen and everything else is moved sort of the opposite direction the player was moving. It'll all become clear next next week or the week after. Okay. So, so back before, to layer. Before you go on, uh, yeah, but I have a question about the layer. Okay. Uh, so when you add... Let me just make a clarification or you, you know, get, you to, get you to make a clarification. Sure. When you add objects... In Corona, they they, they follow a, a pattern where the, the first one that is added is um, is is the is the bottom layer, I guess you could say, and then and then when you add something else, it gets added on top of whatever that is. So if you're going to lay down a background image, and then you could lay down a player, and then you could lay down whatever else, right? And then they would be stacked on top of each other. So are you are you so you're saying? that you shouldn't normally do it that way or things should be put into these layers? You should not rely or? upon that. You should understand that it works that way. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll explain why. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, you're correct. Um, in Corona, if you don't make your own display group ever, there is still one display group that is created for you. It's called the current stage. The current stage is sort of like the master display group that contains everything in your game, all the rendering all the display objects. So if you don't specify a display group when you create an object, it's put in the current stage. Now the way Corona works, it uses what's called the, <clears throat> the painter's model. The painter's model says that when you create object A and then you create object B later and you put them in the same position, object B, because it was created later, will be rendered over the top of A. Basically, Anything created later is always rendered over the top of things that are created before those things. 
if you don't hear it. So, because display groups are themselves layerable objects, you can create them in a specific order, which will ensure their vertical layering. So, for example, if you look at the code I'm showing here, I create a group called Layers, another one called Underlay, World, Content 1, etc., etc., and up to line 41, the way these are organized is Layers is first, Underlay is on top of that, World is on top of that, and so on and so forth. So to that point in the code where the painter's model has been enforced. Uh, just a note, you'll notice that I created layers, which is it's a local variable at the top of the file. So I created a group and stored it in layers. And then I said layers dot underlay. Now the reason I'm doing this is because I'm going to pass this variable around in my code, but I want to have easy access to all these other display groups by name. So later, when I wanted to put an object in layers underlay, I could simply do this. Layers underlay. If I had a reference to this variable here, I could type layers underlay insert and whatever the object is that I wanted to insert into the group. So what I do for my own ease of programming is I will create one master group and then I will dot notate the names give unique names to every other layer and have a reference to them so that I can always refer to them by name. It just makes it easier to code, easier to understand later on when I'm looking at my code. So let me undo this change here. Got a little ahead of myself. All right. Okay, so at this point on line 41, created a number of layers. They're organized in the painter's model, bottom to top, the creation order. Not what I want. What I really want is I would like to have underlay beneath world, world beneath overlay, and overlay on top of everything else. In addition to that, within the world group, I want to start creating a bunch of sub-layers that each of them will be above underlay, and below overlay. The other way you can control ordering in Corona is when you insert an object into a group, that object instantly becomes the topmost layer within that group. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying layers, and then I insert underlay, world, and overlay. So these are all now sorted. Underlay is in the bottom. World is on uh, in the middle, and overlay being the last one is now on the top. Then I take content one, two, three, and I insert them into the world. And what that gives me, I'm going to zoom way in here, is from bottom to top now, underlay is on the bottom, world is above that, and then within that group is content one, two, and three. And finally, on top of everything else, is overlay. With this small set of groups, now I have a place to put my background images to ensure they're always in the background. I have a place to construct a layered world where I can put hallway elements and ensure that some are on top of others. For example, I'm going to put my player in content 3, but I'm going to build my hallway using content 1 and 2 because I want to have certain layering rules for the parts of the hallway. So, so are we, then the, the big benefit here is that we have a much more robust way of, of creating and managing the, the layers of our content? Is that what we're talking about? Or yeah, absolutely. There, At or? this point, now we have a series of groups which we know exactly how they're organized from bottom to top. And when we put our objects into those groups, we always ensure the objects rendering relative to the other layers. Within a group, things will still be on top of each other and following the painter's model. But by doing this, we've simplified our creation rules greatly. And you don't have to worry about doing two front and two back and resorting things manually. It's none, All that goes away when you start using groups. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 it, mentally, again, I, I like to get a visual picture of these types of things. I'm, I'm thinking I'm looking at Photoshop, 
and I've created, you know, 20 layers. And one of those layers is, you know, a foot, and one of those layers is a head, and one of those layers is a, you know, cloud. And I'm like, eventually you're like, oh, I don't, um, I, you know, you start moving things around in order to get things in the right order, and it kind of get really get confusing. So, you know, in Photoshop, you create a group, and then you take and you stick all that, or you know, which looks like a little folder, you stick all the related items into that group, and then now you're just managing the groups. Uh, now you've got or, a hierarchy. Of the groups. Yeah, now you have a hierarchy, and so uh, I just want to make sure that everybody gets gets kind of a, a mental picture of what we're talking about and, and why we might want to do that, you know, as opposed to just the default, like you said, putting everything into the, the one um, default group. So, um, yeah, That's exactly why I do it, because otherwise you're just trying to manage chaos, and it's very hard as your game has more and more objects in it to remember and to control what objects are visible on top of other objects. And, and in fact, it becomes impossible once you introduce interfaces to control things correctly. You need groups. Uh, it's worth mentioning that we did all this by hand, but all of this coding using... I have, an, I have a tool in SSK, which we're not going to use on this game. We'll use it in future games. For creating custom layer layouts, and all you do is call the function and pass in names for the layers, and it produces them in the, the order that you pass in the names, and you can create grouped sublayers with this too. One, one depth of sublayers. So we could have created all of this in one line of code, but I wanted to demonstrate this time around the principle of it, and so you can look at the code and understand how this comes out in the end. So let's go to main.lua. If we go all the way to the bottom, our master module, which I mentioned last week, which is game. The first thing we do is game init. And then if we look at game init, we'll see a function in here called on line 36 called public.init. And what this does basically is one of the first real pieces of work it does is it create it calls the layers module and tells it to create those layers, that bit of code that we just looked at. That function itself will return a reference to layers, which then we can use to initialize the other modules. Now I haven't done it yet. We're going to uncomment code as we go along in our discussion here so you can start to see things happen. But on line 45, we would initialize the one touch input and pass in layers because it's going to need to know about those layers. We can initialize the player module and pass in the layers because again, it needs to know about these layers for rendering things. And finally, which we are going to leave commented, uh, uncommented at this point, we can initialize the walls module. <clears throat> so let's jump into what the walls module does, and then we'll come back here and start adding more things if we have time. So you'll recall that when I said that we were going to... Um, let me get this running here. <clears throat> we were going to do this. What we want to do is we want to break down the wall drawing problem to something as simple as possible. And so to do that, we will draw lines initially to show you what we're trying to do. And then I'll break it out into creating actual rectangles and moving them around and, and explaining how this works. Let me take a look at the initialization code. There's nothing that needs to be said here. All we do is take the layer that is passed in as parent and store it locally in a reference to layers, which is a global, a local variable at the top of the file. Let me let me go back into game. Sorry here, I got a little discombobulated. Um, one of the things is is when we initialize our our game. If you remember from the image, the starting screen has the player, but it's not moving. It has an initial long hallway that goes up from the bottom right to the top left, so it's a very long segment before it starts twisting. And so this is what we're trying to achieve. So when you initialize the game, one of the things it's going to do is it's going to set up all the layers and it's going to tell the modules, it's going to initialize the modules, but then it's also going to need to start drawing these segments, the initial hallway segment, which is what we're going to create today. <clears throat> so on line 50, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uncomment some code which is going to draw a blue background so we have something better to look at. And when I do that, I'm going to put the blue background in the underlay so that it's below everything else. So now let's save that code. 
I have a little window over here which I'll make bigger later so you can see it, but I'll keep it small as we go along right now so we can see the code and the results at the same time. <clears throat> okay, so now the background is blue, but the other thing that this code did is this rather complicated, and I won't explain it all quite yet, piece of code, but the important part here is it called a function called new segment within the wall module. And it's going to put the segment at position X, Y, which we've calculated above. I'll explain this later. It says make the segment at a minus 45 degree angle, which is what this argument is. And then it's going to give it a length of first length, which is 200, and a path width of path width, which is 100. So it's going to be 200 pixels long, 100 pixels wide. Now, clearly what we're showing here is a line. So let's start to break down the code and see how to make this line be something more useful. One of the first things I discovered when I did this was the easiest way to draw a hallway is to draw something, center it, and then return a, return a couple of values to tell me where the end of that segment was. So when I draw my next segment, that I can simply start from that point because this is an endless runner. What's going to happen is we're going to be producing more and more hallway segments as we go along. So we need to know where the end of the last hallway segment was. So we can create our next segment right there and then more and more and more always advancing. So the first thing we do, and this is really complicated seeming, but it's relatively straightforward once you understand the principle. I took a function called angle to vector fast, which comes out of the SSK Corona libraries. And I'm, I'm not going to show you how it works today because this we can do a discussion of 2D math in the future. But basically what this function does is it converts an angle into a vector, a unit length vector. Now a unit length vector, for people who don't understand this, is a vector whose length is 1. And the reason a unit length vector is important is because we can then use that in all kinds of interesting ways. For example, for people who understand 2D math, we can take a unit length vector and convert it into a line segment, in a sense, by multiplying it by a value of, say, 5. And that would say this line segment is now 5 in length. It's a nice malleable vector that we can choose the length. Not, I'm not doing a very good job. I'll just walk through the code. How's that? So angle to vector. I take the angle. It's going to re return an x and a y, which represent the vector. I'm going to use another function. I'm going to pass those x, uh, x and y values in, which I call vx and dy, and a, a length argument. Now, remember, I had a length of 200 pixels. So what this is saying is create for me a vector whose length is 200 pixels. And the angle of that vector is 45 degrees to the left, minus 45 degrees. So that's what we have at this point. Now the only thing we have to do is position it. Now people who are listening to this who are not familiar with 2D math, just bear with me, but those who are familiar will understand that the way that you position a vector in any world view is simply by taking the vector you have and adding a value to it. So our vector at this point is, you can consider it positionless. It's merely a length. But by adding the initial x and y to it, what we're saying is, is move this vector to that place in the world. And then finally, after all this, I can draw a line that starts at x and y and ends at vx, vy. So all of that work was basically to, to take this point here and draw a line 200 pixels to the left and up so that we had this little endpoint right here where my, my cursor is going around on the screen, which is what you're seeing. So, for example, if I made this length or width 4, you see that that's the line that we just created with this code. Now I just made it a little bit thicker, just so you could, you could see it in the demo. So, not very useful. However, let's go back to the game. And let's uncomment the rest of this code here. I'm not going to explain too much what it's doing, but what it's doing in a nutshell is it's drawing a segment, it's returning 
this last position right here, which then we will pass in as the next argument and tell it to draw from here at a certain angle for a certain distance. And when you're done, return the position of the new end of that line. So every time it draws a line, it's going to return the last position of this, basically what you could consider as like the dot that would go there. So let's, <clears throat> let's save that. Now what we've got is a four segment line. We can't see it all because it extends off the screen, but we got one, two, and three. And then this last se segment is off of the screen. So I could, I could theoretically just do this. So now we've got progress. Now we've got a zigzagging path of sorts, but it's completely useless to us because there's no walls. There's not really a path, but it gives us the outline of what we need to do. It was this point that it occurred to me that the easiest way to make this work is now that we have this, these segments, I can find the middle of every segment We're doing just a little bit of math, and then I can place a rectangle here and rotate it, a rectangle of the correct length, and rotate it, place another one in the middle of this segment, rotate it to the right, this segment, rotate it to the left, and as long as they have the right length, what I will have is rectangles that are over the position of these lines, which is what this next piece of code does. So this is step one of making the walls, of understanding how we make the walls. So I'm going to uncom uncomment line 59, and then the math that I'm doing here is basically what I want to do is calculate the center. And calculating the center of a vector is as simple as taking the two components, Vx and Vy, and then subtracting the position offset, dividing that value by 2, and then adding the position value back. So what I have done uh, mathematically is a vector defines um, a direction and a position, but I want to take the position part out while I'm trying to find the middle. It's This is not a math class, so just, just trust me that what you have to do is move it to the center of the world, in a sense, is what we're doing here. We're taking the positioning out by subtracting x and y, which is from here, taking that resulting value, dividing that by 2, splitting it in the middle, and then re removing it back to where we want it, the offset, in a sense. And what that produces is the position of the center of this line right here. Then I say, create a new rectangle, put it in layers content 2, which is our middle layer in the world, place it at mx, my, which is the center position here, make it 4 pixels wide, that's just an arbitrary, arbitrary value that I chose, and make it as long as the segment is supposed to be, and then rotate it by the angle. If I did not rotate it, this is what we would get initially. It's a bunch of rectangles, very thin rectangles, centered on the, these lines. But simply by rotating them, now we've got a bunch of rectangular segments. And I'll make this a little bit bigger so people can see it. Rectangular segments which overlap perfectly the line that we just drew. Now we're getting somewhere. Now we got like one half of our wall. It occurred to me, well it occurred to me before I did this step, but that once you've done this, once you've solved this problem, I'm waving at the screen like people can see me, all you really got to do is create two rectangles and then move one to the left by a certain amount and one to the right by a certain amount and you'll get a hallway. So to prove that out, I'm going to comment out these two bits of uh, code. That drew just one wall. And I'm going to go here to line 69. I'm going to enable this bit of code. I'm going to use the MX MY from our last, which is it's the center piece here. Let me move. Come on, get out of the way. It's the center bit here. I'm going to create two rectangles that initially will be right here, but then what I do is I move one over by half the width of the hallway to the left, and I move the other one to the right by half the width of the hallway so that in a theory we get the whole width, correct? They're still four pixels wide each, and they are the same length. Let me take this bit out. 
same length as they were before. So let's do that. Oh, and then I rotate them both by the same amount. And if we make sure that's saved, if we run that now, now we have our original line, which showed what we were trying to achieve, but now, now it's starting to look like a hallway. But we have got a problem. We have got this little gap. Why do we have a gap? Because the more we move these to the left and right, the longer they have to be to overlap. And in fact, the math of this is simple. Actually, it's, this is not true. It doesn't matter how far you move them. Because they have a thickness of 4 pixels, they each need to be 2 pixels longer on each direction. So all we got to do to get a nice overlap is add 4, basically add the width. Whatever I choose here, if I made this 8, I'd have to make this 8. So let's add 4 to each one. I can type. Put that back to 4. Save it. Now we have perfect hallways. Exactly angled, overlapping, no extras. Everything looks, it's starting to look real good. But we're not quite there yet. Now let's move on to the step which is sort of what I call beautification. What we really like to see is something that at least approaches if we forget about these extra hallways in the background, just the main hallway, we want it to be blue with a little bit of a glow with a different blue so that people can clearly see what's going on on the screen. So let's do that. The way we do that is I basically took a screenshot of this into my, uh, my um, I don't have Photoshop, but you could take it into Photoshop. I did a grab and I said, what, what is that color? What is this color? What is this color? And I pulled the color codes out, the hex color codes. So the hex color code that I pulled out for the hallway edges, the uh, the walls, was eight uh, was zero x a eight c b d e. But for color codes in Corona, we need to split these up into R G B. So if you have a color code that is a a b b c c in hex, all you got to do is take the first two second two and the third two, split them apart, say 0x because it's a hexadecimal number, 0x, the color code. So if this was AA, I'd put AA. Take that, that now becomes a number, which will be calculated by Lua, and then divide it by 255 because the hex color codes that you're going to be using in your program will be a 0 to 255. A long story short, I snagged the color from the image. I figured out that the first part was AA, the second part was CB, and the second part was uh, the third part was DE. That I then split them up, put a zero x in front of it, divided by 255, and I created this table. Why did I create a table? Because I didn't want to type this every time. So if I create a table with Entry 1 is the red part, entry 2 is the blue part, and entry 3 is the green part. Later, I can call set fill color, and then I can use this Lua function called unpack and pass the table. And this right here would be the equivalent of if I had typed this every time. But now, if I wish to adjust this color, I can simply adjust it up here like make it more green or uh, blue. Now I don't have to type these two lines again. And any place else where I use the fill color, it's all done because I'm using this table and it's used over and over. Okay, so let's do that. Let's save it. Okay, now we got a kind of blue edge. Now let's add a, the path background. So adding a path background. Kind of tricky. What we're going to do in practice is we're going to draw a rectangle over this segment right here and we're going to use just basically draw a fat rectangle that is as wide as the hallway is from here to here but this is going to create for us a problem because it's not going to completely fill the hallway so we just drew basically a rectangle here rectangle here but there's little gaps missing the other thing that we have trouble with when we do this is how, how wide is this rectangle supposed to be? 
it's not actually the width of the hallway as we've chosen it, because the width of the hallway is horizontally a certain distance. This is another one of those math problems. Because we've rotated to a 45 degree, the true width from this line across the segment to this line is the width that we chose horizontally divided by the square root of 2. So let me, let me be clear. If you have a 100 pixel width horizontally and then you rotate it to the left, that's, how do I, that, that's not right. Okay, no. So if you'll recall, what we've done is we drew two rectangles and then we moved one a certain number of pixels, let's call it 50 pixels to the right, another one 50 pixels to the left. Well, that doesn't mean that the point between here and here is 50 pixels. That's not right. The distance between here and here is 50 divided by the square root of 2. The distance between here and here is 50 divided by the square root of 2. It's just a math question. So what you'd see if I had not done that, if I said assume that it was the width of the hallway, is you would get this. This is the true width that we tried to achieve for the hallway. So from any point horizontally here, straight across, is the same distance as here down at an angle. It's wrong. It's too thick. It's actually, the hallway is not quite 100 pixels wide. It's closer to like 78 pixels wide or whatever it is. Square root of 2. Anyways, so let's put it back. So e easy trick. 45 degree angles are wonderful. Um, for people who are familiar with the Pythagorean theorem, the other way to do this is to figure out well, how tall is the rectangle or the triangle, and how wide is the foot, and a squared over c, like a squared plus b squared equals c squared, or whatever the heck, heck it is. I can't even remember the dang thing right now. You could apply that, but 45 degree angles are beautiful because the shortcut to that is the distance is basically whatever the width was you had divided by the square root of two. So just just follow my code, I guess. I really, yeah, we should do a math segment. So Some, somewhere, yeah, is, my 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 high school math teacher is is pointing and laughing at me right now. I, I know I'm not doing a good. No, you're okay, doing a, you're doing a fine job. It's just a, I'm yeah. not a math teacher, so I'm really right. bad at explaining. The problem here is I understand it well enough to do it, but yeah. not well enough to explain it to a layman. Yeah, that's okay. But the the, the point the point being that it's you would think that it's fifty. 50 pixels here, 50 pixels there, but it's not, and so... Yeah, it's not, because okay. we didn't really make it wide. What we did was we just moved these things left and right, but then we achieved this segment here, which is some width. We just don't know what it is. Okay. The easy answer is it's the width that we tried to achieve horizontally, but divided by the square root of 2. Sim simple as easy as pie. So how do we solve this problem with these gaps? Because what we've done is we've drawn a rectangle that basically overlaps our original line. Great. The trick is, we know that if we think about it for a minute, that this is nothing more than a square that has an edge length of one half the width of this hallway. So all we got to do is create a square that has this width for each of its sides. It's a square and move it over by one quarter of the hallway width and rotate it by the angle. Because you can see it. It's like, think about it. What is this? It's a square, rotated, certain width, easy. So let's go ahead and create a rectangle. Give it the width over the square root. So same value as this. Give it a fill color. And, and all we do is... Rotate it. So was this was this solution less expensive than just say like trying to figure out that I need to make my rectangle you know fifty pixels longer? Yeah. So the other choice was let me let me uncomment this code so people can see what you're saying. The other thing that you could try to do is you could try to get tricky and make this rectangle longer and this rectangle longer so that they perfectly abutted. But there is no simple Simple, there's, a, there's a way to do this mathematically, but it, I, it was too hard to explain. 
if you think I'm having trouble explaining divide by the square root of 2, the math for calculating this not easy to explain. Okay, it's not a factor of the square root of 2 anymore and I said, you know what? Let's just do this. It's going to cost us one extra rectangle to cover it up, but we're not going to keep them around forever, which is a discussion for another day. But later when we go into camera work, I'll explain how, how we create and delete things over time. But we're not going to have a bunch of rectangles forever. So okay. we'll just create two rectangles to solve the problem. Easy peasy. And it's squeaky yeah. done. Because I don't yeah, the only reason I mentioned it is because I'm sure somebody out there was going, well, well just make just make the rectangles longer. <laughs> yeah. You could make the rectangles longer, but the math to do it is not easily defined for the layman. So this is much easier to understand. Okay, so what's left? Let's make the glow. What is the glow? The glow is nothing more than another segment, a little bit wider, offset a little bit, and maybe with a slightly different alpha or color. So what I chose to do was to make a segment that was wider than this and then move the left one over a little bit to the right, the right one over a little bit to the left, and change the alpha. And then because I always want my glow to be beneath these wall segments, I put the glow in content 3. The path is in content 1, so which we know is over the top of content 3. So let's just uncomment this code. Which, which, which while you're there, uh, is a great illustration of this whole layering concept that we were talking about earlier, is that if you had a single file and you put all your code at top bottom, then everything would be ordered in the, in the order in which you put it. But here you're, you're, you're clearly putting something in the content one and the content three at different points within your code. Um, so you really don't have that sequential layering. The, the, the sequential... I'm There's not, much less thought that goes into this now. Yeah. Now I just say, I want this on top of that, put it in the right layer, done. Right. Versus, so. oh, wait, I created that last, now i got to move it up, or i got to do some other thing. i got to account for the... Painter's model. Yeah, no, yeah, you're, no you're, you're, model worries here. you're you're more co focused on the the execution of your code as opposed to the layering of it. Absolutely. Okay. So let's just create the, the the glow. It's got the same rotation. The only thing that I did here was is the same problem is is these had to be even longer, so I made them slightly longer. So you can remember the other one was four. I added six pixels to this, uh, and um, I made them wider, so these are not four, they're nine pixels, and that's what we get. So, you know, it's not quite as beautiful as what they did, but this is a first approximation. We can do more to make this nicer. We're not So far, we're not doing any shader effects. We're just doing raw rendering of basic rectangles, and now we got this versus this. So this is theirs, and this is ours. Pretty close. I mean, except for this line in the middle. So let's make let's finish it off. Let's go ahead and make it the rest of the way like theirs. So what's whoops, I'm just closing all the wrong windows here. What's left? Well, we forgot the physics bodies. So for now, I'm just gonna add generic physics bodies to left wall and right wall. I'm gonna make them static and I'm not gonna give them any other arguments today. We'll go all about we'll talk all about collision detection later. I just want to show you and make sure that the hybrid rendering is on. If you go into uh, main Lua, there's a line here on line 36 to render hybrid. And what this will do is it will show us the rectangle. It will also so show us a little bit of physics information when it renders. Uh, get back to the wall. So let's save. The code is saved. And now when we redraw this, now it shows us all the same stuff I had before. But you'll see this little hook here. You can't quite see it very well, but there's a red line and a little green line. And this is showing us basically the angle, and then the shading has changed. It's sort of greenish. There is an extra rendering going on that shows us this is where the body is that encompasses the wall. So now we know. I, I know from experience, but just looking at this, this little red line is saying, yep, that is oriented correctly. I can see the outline is perfectly overlapping. Now I have a hallway with physics going on. Done. So if you wanted to, you could create a little ball, give it a physics body, drop it into that that hallway there, and it would just go bouncing around down Absolutely. to the end. Of, Actually, uh, I did that on the initial example, but I took it out because we, I moved right into the player. 
So there's still one thing that's wrong with this. This hallway, okay, here's the beauty of this. We're done. Our, that's it. That's the function we need to draw segments from here on. As, in fact, as you can see, we drew one segment, then we drew another one and another one. And all we did was took the value of the function returned, passed it in to the next call, and it created the segment in the right location. So, oh, we should probably turn off that center line, actually. Let's go ahead and do that. So, 56, 57, I basically stopped drawing the line. And that was just a guideline for our conversation, is that correct? Just a guideline for the conversation, not something you needed. Uh, what else is left? If we look at this, this isn't quite right. It's great for a demo, but it's not what is shown in the game. The game hallway is much wider and much longer on the initial segment. So all we do is we go back to game. You'll remember I said in game, in the initialization, we're going to draw the first few segments so everything is there to start the game. So let's make the segment 1,000 pixels long for the first one. And let's make them all 200 pixels wide. And I know this because I tried the values out earlier. But now we have something that looks a lot more like where we are here. 45 degree angle, all eight. Let me turn off the, because the coloring is a little goofed up because of the uh, hybrid. And you, and you just said that we're initializing, we're creating the, the first segment, and I assume that means that later on we will programmatically create the We remains. will programmatically create additional segments as we need them, mm -hmm. but you don't want to create, you can't, it's impossible, it's endless. You couldn't create all the segments because you don't know how many you need. See, you need to create them as you go along. But you need to create a certain number of them to start, otherwise you got no place to start your game. Let me find hybrid here. And while he's doing that, I just want to remind everybody that we will have a link in the show notes to this so that you can pull the code and go and take a look at what Ed's doing. Absolutely. You can download the code uh, <clears throat> and try this out on your own and run it. So now if I run this, now we got something that looks a lot like, not exactly, but very close to what they have here. This one I've actually zoomed in a bit more. But that's pretty much it. Um, so we've run out of time. So next week we'll have to talk about it. But I also produced the code for the player and the touch input. I was going to get us as far as actually navigating the hallway. But uh, we won't do that. Because the next bits of this code, really simple. Really simple. This is like the hardest thing. Okay. The, the only other thing that's going to be on this level of difficulty is uh, generating more segments uh, dynamically. But it's pretty easy. So once you figured out how to draw the hallway, letting the cat out of the bag on this project, most of the work is done as far as figuring out difficult math. Okay. Well, excellent. Well, we'll, we'll save that for next time then. And... Uh... That's good. I think that's a good start. And we'll put a link in the show notes so people can go get the code. All right. So yes. uh, I'm, I'm actually working with Renee I about uh, doing a series of blog posts on 2D math. So he's got a whole project kind of uh, in his head that he wants to take on as, as a way to kind of break down all the different concepts around 2D math. So hopefully we can get that kind of kicked off. Uh, that might be a good primer for anyone who is new to 2, 2D math. They didn't call it 2D math when I was in high school. They called it geometry. And, uh, and I, I had no idea that would be valuable. So well, Actually, I would say they didn't call it geometry. They called they, half of it geometry. Oh, the right. other half of it would be vector math. Yeah. Well, there was... Well, college. Yeah. Generally. Yeah. Yeah. I think I took a... Well, we, we called it geometry one and two. So maybe it was vector math. And I just... I didn't... Yeah, maybe. Maybe I could be wrong. My memory could be well, definitely faulty. It was only like school, so. 30 years ago, so... I didn't go to your high school, so, you know, whatever. Well, I also took a class where we uh, castrated pigs, so, you know. <laughs> wow. It could, be, it could have been... This, this show went downhill fast. It could have been that they didn't... Well, I'm serious. It could have been that they just didn't do vector math. And, and, and well, that's a skill I shoot, I'm sh uh, sure you use on a very regular basis. Too. Hey, somebody used it to get elected to Congress last year, right? So, whatever. <laughs> I hope we're talking about vector math. I don't think <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, it was a commercial. So I just want to give I just want to give out some props here to to Jason who who is doing the uh, um, 
the office space in the car today. Yeah, Freddie loves your office today. <laughs> I'll tell you what. And, and yeah, I, I, actively... I was working. I actually took the day off to do some app work, so I took a day off from my day job, and I was at the library, but they have a quiet room there, and I can't talk like this. And yes. when I saw the announcement, uh, you know, and I figured Walter was going to be on, which is pretty rare. I said, you know, I'm going to do it, but I'll have to go what I call the mobile app studio. Yeah. Well, hopefully you're <laughs> using the library's Wi-Fi and not chewing through your data plan. So. Uh, the, 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 it's, um, I'm, I'm, the, uh, the day job buys me an iPad with a cell plan. So. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, thanks for joining. Thanks for, for sticking it out, man. I mean, that if they watch the video. That's all there is to it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, good. Yeah, I just wanted to call that out because I think that's a great idea doing the, uh, doing the, the, the mobile, the mobile uh, development platform there. Uh, all right. Well, hey, we got one more announcement before we we head out of here. Thanks for everybody for hanging on for so long. I know this is a long show, but we got lots of lots of stuff in you know today's uh, today's hangout. Uh, our last announcement here is that our winner of February's Geek Game. So every every month we're playing a game, and the winner gets a fifty dollars gift card at the end. Uh, so basically, the high score winner, whoever has the high score, uh, Noah Mailovich. Uh, is the winner this this uh, month. He is the developer over at ChunkyApps.com. If you haven't checked out his uh, site in a while, definitely go over and do that. Uh, he's m most known for um, uh, City Birds. He's been on the show before as a guest. Uh, has an excellent app over there uh, for City Birds. If you have, guys haven't played that, check it out. He's also created a whole bunch of apps since then. Uh, he's got fa uh, Fantasy Night Football, and then he's got Deflate Gate. A um, whole bunch of different, just a whole bunch of different apps over there. I'm trying to capitalize, I guess, on the sports thing. He also has a meathead love coach, so you guys check that out. He's got lots of great uh, art skills, and so everything is very cartoonish, very fun to play, you know, so good stuff like that. So congratulations, Noah, and thanks for playing. Also, I have here that uh, Tony Godfrey, uh, so Noah came in at 368, and we were actually playing, um, uh, what was the name we were playing? We were playing... Uh, Crossy Road. Thank yeah. you. So we were playing Crossy Road. Uh, Noah came in at 368, which I thought was incredible because Crossy Road is a very challenging uh, Frogger style game. Uh, Tony Godfrey came in at 339, and then um, and then Danny Danny Hunt came in at 323, and so those were the top scores. And those guys it was fantastic because I, I know I can't get Where more than. Greg? Huh? Well, Greg said he. Greg tried it. He tried, and Greg is our reigning champion. Greg is our reigning champion. I think three, two or three times in a row on this. Um, but he said it just, it just didn't. Uh, he just didn't gel with it. You know, not, not all games are. I think he was just giving us a break. He was going easy on us. Yeah. He didn't want to slam us all. You know, monkey. Yeah, yeah. So congratulations to Noah. Noah, I'll be, I'll be contacting you to get your gift certificate. And uh, so yeah, go to, go over to chunkyapps.com and check out Noah's work. He's got lots of good stuff over there. So for March. We are playing. Uh, we're going to play Zigzag Boom. It's our it's, get everybody it, into it. Yeah, it's get in, get into it. Get uh, accustomed to the uh, dynamics because that's the app that we're using for this Endless Runner game series breakdown. And uh, it's also available on iOS and Android. We'll have links in the show notes. You can check it out. Uh, you know, it's frustratingly fun and uh, I think it's a good. You know, it's a good high score kind of competition app. So, so that would be. All that I'm trying to clone it for this. I haven't played it enough to know. One thing that I don't know that is a possibility is that as you get further down the hallway, because I, I only get like four turns and I'm dead. I'm not really good at this <laughs> game. <laughs> I can adjust the difficulty on the one I'm writing. But uh, on theirs, I don't know if once you get further down the hallway, if things start to change up a bit. And I'm curious about that because there's things you could do in this basic model to change things up. You could split the hallway. You could make the hallway less wide. You could put obstacles in the hallway. Well, see, that was that was actually part of, believe it or not, that was part of my uh, genius is to leverage the community as a test laboratory. Right. So if people see other features that I'm not talking about, definitely mention them because I'd love to put them in here. Because yeah. that's a, even if they don't, this is one of the, I said it before, uh, the Me Too Plus thing. I really encourage people to take other people's ideas and say, you know, I could do that, but don't just do a clone. Do something with it, make it more. And in this case, those are some things that people could do to make it more. Me yep. Too Plus. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> 
All right, so there you go. That's uh, I think that's our last announcement for today. Thanks, guys, for being here. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, Corona's now free. Go check it out. Um, Fuse Power is trying to make developers more money on the same amount of of of, of, of app installs, same amount of, of impressions, you know, on on screen views and stuff like that. So go check them out. They've recently refreshed everything, and uh, be back here next Monday at 12 p.m. Pacific, and we will continue this conversation about our endless runner, how we how to implement the player and the controls and whatever Ed has for next for us. All right, have a great week and happy coding. No fitters in.